This video is brought to you by Knowledge at the Australian School of Business. For many Sydney siders, the Harbour Bridge is Sydney. It's an iconic image you see on the skyline everywhere you go around the city. Equally, for many tourists taking a trip down under, they want to experience the Harbour Bridge. They want to climb to the top and see the image that has been there ever since the uh, bridge uh, opened in 1932. Of course, famously, it wasn't opened officially. It was actually opened by Captain de Groot, who rode along on his horse and sliced open the ribbon at the time. But nobody uh, from 1932 onwards could experience a view from the top until Paul Cave came along. He launched Bridge Climb in 1998, since when it's taken millions of people to the top of the bridge so they can see the view. It is very much a tourist attraction for Sydney. Paul Cave has been closely associated with the University of New South Wales since doing his economics degree there in 1969. He's then had close associations with the Australian School of Business. Paul Cave still runs Bridge Climb here from the Clydebank building. Let's talk to him now. I'm pleased to say Paul Cave is with me now. So, Thanks, hello, Julian. Hello, Paul. <laughs> um, firstly, how did you come up with the idea of the Bridge Climb? Gosh, quite a long story, but it was really my father-in-law, who's, who's long since died, but uh, on the day the bridge was opened, on the 19th of March 32, he managed to get, convince his mum that he should come in to watch the opening, and with a brother, the two of them came in. What he hadn't said to his mother, that they'd rolled up a blanket, each of them, and they came in on that day, the 19th of March, saw the bridge open, but then they slept at Wynyard Railway Station that night. And at 5 a.m. the next morning, when the ticket office opened, uh, George and his brother bought tickets numbers one and two for, for crossing the bridge. And, and that was uh, firstly the inspiration, and, and I inherited that ticket. And uh, I'm sure he'd be pretty delighted if he knew what journey that ticket has since taken me on. Yeah, but of course, that's a, uh, your family history in the past, but yes. what, how, how did you turn that into a business venture of getting people to climb the Harbour Bridge and, of course, pay for the privilege? Yeah, yes. Well, well I guess the, the fascination became a, a passion and, and then an obsession. And uh, I then was playing a game of squash with Nick Greiner and uh, we were sort of debating some of the things we could do with this group from Young Presidents' Organisation that we were both members of that were coming to Australia in '89. And one of the things was, in fact, climbing the bridge as a thought. And uh, I said to Nick, let me look after that. So he, he gave me the name of the chief executive of the RTA and hence the idea started to, to permeate. And then we talked to the RTA about the possibility of doing that with that group of people and after another nine months managed to piece that together. So, And then I think having had the chance to take a big group of people up there and seeing how incredibly special it was, uh, I thought this is a, a chance to share this with the world. Uh, this, is, this is just incredible. <laughs> but to launch the venture, you obviously needed quite a lot of cash. You know, how, how did you get the financing uh, together to, to, to get the Bridge Climb uh, company? Well, I guess the cash came secondarily because the first thing was, was there a practical way to do this and prudent way to do it? And, frankly needed to work on the idea and keep it under wraps. And, and doing that, uh, the research actually took us two or three years anyway to look at the possibility of attaching people and could we do it with heritage and ecological issues all embraced within that, environmental things. So a lot of work was done and had to be done very, very quietly, and, and it was. Uh, but that was what really took a lot of time uh, to, to get to that point. And I borrowed a million from four peers, uh, telling them I could make this happen in two years, not knowing it was then going to take nine years and ten months from that point forward. So, And in fact, some of your investors, were they getting a little bit worried after a couple yeah, of years they wondering got, what? Uh, I thought these guys were, were mates. <laughs> <laughs> but I think as with lots of entrepreneurs, we're, we're frequently very optimistic, super optimists. But the actualization of this was, was a, took a, an enormous amount of detail and dealing with bureaucracy was uh, something within itself that was a significant part of the challenge. And of course, for many entrepreneurs wanting to launch their own company, they want to keep it confidential, but how do you keep something quiet as big as a bridge climb? Yeah, yeah, look, that was, that was probably one of the biggest challenges. We put together a confidentiality agreement that was umpteen pages in length and it was quite comprehensive. We actually had 260-odd people sign that, 
It was staggering uh, th that we managed to work on this idea for six years without it getting out, but that became a, a reason, a significant part of the, of the importance of what is a simple idea and protecting it, very important. Even with a patent attorney and a lawyer signing confidentiality agreements, which they were affronted originally when they were asked. I can certainly see why some people will be surprised, particularly when they're dealing something as basic as health and safety. Again, how did you reassure people that the bridge climb was going to be safe and it wouldn't interfere with the basic maintenance on the bridge? Look, in the end, uh, one of the wonderful parts of bureaucracy responsible for workplace safety, we took the concept to them. And of course, it included putting people in suits and harnesses and breath testing. And, and I think they thought this was a wonderful thing because the workers on the bridge in years gone by have worked up there without harnesses, etc. And they thought, well, getting you up there might in fact be a, a real positive. So they were very supportive. And, and that was a, a part of bureaucracy that was very helpful. Uh, and equally now it has been launched. It's been very successful in terms of promoting Australia, in terms of a marketing uh, idea that will encourage people sure. to come to Sydney. There yes. is this great attraction here. But how did you actually launch the marketing to start with, where it must have seemed like a strange concept for people, climbing up a bridge on a day out? What, why should people do that? <laughs> well, we're incredibly fortunate to be able to share and show off the bridge. I mean, it's a huge icon of this country and, and a signature, I think, of Sydney and Australia. And, Frankly, the public relations part of a, a unique idea, if you've got one, is, uh, is, is quite remarkable. So that when an Oprah comes to Australia, she wants to climb the bridge and, you know, a billion people see the story. And, you know, I think that's a significant part of two thirds of our climbers are international. We're getting frequently getting press interest and in international people and celebrities climbing. And that is a, a huge part of the, the marketing presentation of the product. Let me take you back a little bit, because after all, you're now very well known for the Harbour Bridge, but many people may not know about your connection with Amber Tiles. You, you uh, started the company when you were a young entrepreneur, 29, if I believe. Uh, do, do, you, do you see a sort of uh, disconnect between their company making tiles and now you're in effect running a tourist attraction? Look, I think if you've got an idea, and ideally it's a unique idea, um, and then you have a a theme or an approach and with Amber, uh, for example, we were doing something that was a little different. We were combining tiles with paving and we were running a do-it-yourself business, teaching people how to lay tiles. So, and that was a first in this country. And, and I think doing that uh, separated ourselves from the tile industry and that company became the largest tile company in Australia and, and that was great. Although I stayed there for 23 years, which frankly was about five years beyond my use-by date, so, yeah. But, but you must have learnt a lot from running one company that you could then use in terms of your management style and how to deal with all the uh, issues you had in developing a new business yes. uh, with a bridge climb. Uh, how do you define your own management style? You know, I think as an entrepreneur, I'm eminently unemployable. Um, you lead by passion and ideology and, and your your fascination with the product itself and all the service you're offering, hoping to be inspirational and hoping others will share that passion. And we only want people working in Bridge Climb who really are intrigued by the bridge and want to tell the stories and understand it and what relates to it. So that's part of the raison d'etre. Uh, you know, I need a compliment, uh, as in a, a managing director to run it and the, and the two of us together do that uh, hopefully, empathically, and I've just appointed a new managing director running Amber who was running the Opera House previously. So, you know, you, you need to be complimented. Most entrepreneurs are not great managers. Uh, and in fact, uh, the, the, there is almost this debate, uh, certainly we've had it at the Australian School of Business, but in the wider business world, between those people who are entrepreneurs and those people who are innovators, what would you say you are and, and uh, how do you actually define the passion behind somebody who can get, get a project like this off the ground? For me, you need to be somewhat obsessive and, and you need to have a focus and, and there needs to be a very clear goal that you have uh, and never straying from that course. So it's absolutely about firing a, uh, a single rifle and, and never a shotgun and it's being very clear about what that goal is and, and ensuring you, uh, you pursue it doggedly. And it's always a multi-marathon. It's never a sprint. It can be a sprint, uh, but then that dies just as quickly for most people. So 
You know, it's that, that need to want to pursue something and, and, and go to the nth degree. And of course, now you've got the idea, it's been up and running for many years, over a decade, people have been able to climb the bridge. So how do you, as an innovator and an entrepreneur, develop that further? What, what new things can, can you do to develop it? Obviously, find new bridges, I guess. Well, new bridges or rather experiential tourism opportunities are clearly important and desirable. With Bridge Climb, I, in my shareholders' agreement, organised that I might separately start to look internationally. Uh, we've certainly done that. But the principles of the success of a business like Amber or Bridge Climb, you know, I managed to make happen in other ways as well with, uh, with other businesses that I might be on the board of or a business like Interesk Insurance that, that I'm involved in owning or like Domino's Pizza that we floated and I'm part of. Uh, and equally, you may get derailed by things like global financial crisis or, or even the rise of the Australian dollar. That must be hurting your company, where now, upon coming to Australia, find they're here for two weeks, and they're suddenly finding that climbing the bridge will cost twice as much as it was a couple of years ago, four times as much as it did five years ago. Yes, sure. Well, you know, they're the, they're the challenges that business always has, the ups and downs of those various things, and, and you've got to try and work with them uh, and be a realist in, to the extent that you can work with them. So, yes, there are always challenges, uh, and global financial crisis obviously has been a, a challenge for tourism. But Australia, we've just got to get better at our game with the, the branding of the Australian brand and the service we're offering with Bridge Climb. Unless we continue to want to make that business better every single day, then it would be very easy to rest on your laurels and, and I think you'd, you'd probably wither or die in the process. But if you keep innovating and keep changing and improving and looking for growth and for opportunities, uh, that's the reason to get up in the morning and that's the excitement, I think, and the adrenaline of making things happen in, in business and making a difference. And finally, Paul, in your personal life as well, you seem to be wanting to make life better for people every day. You, you really would seem to be want to be improving things through your charitable work. How do you combine that with a successful business career? Well, you know, I guess I'm lucky enough to have survived a reasonably serious cancer scare with several operations uh, with a melanoma, but fortunately survived uh, and I think you want to give back because you, you see that there are, we're very close in this country to, to solving lots of things with cancer, it's happening progressively so the development of the Chris O'Brien Lifehouse, uh, he having been my surgeon and a very, very close friend, uh, it's, it's very gratifying and satisfying to be able to enable his dream to happen. And you know that's right at the cutting edge and will make an enormous difference in this country when, when that centre opens in 18 months' time. So that's uh, fantastic to be able to, to be the recipient of, of, a, of a cancer solution, but then think we can refine and get that better. And so it's wonderful to be, for Chris O'Brien to be doing this. It is indeed. And it's also been wonderful talking to you. Paul, it's been great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Julian. Thank you. For more business news and analysis from Knowledge at the Australian School of Business, please visit knowledge.asb.unsw.edu.au.